The Buddha said that he got on the right path when he began to exert some control over his thoughts. He divided his thoughts into two sorts, not based on whether he liked them or not, or really believed them or not, but based on where they came from and where they were going to lead. If they came from sensuality, ill will, harmfulness in the mind, he knew they were going to lead to bad places. So those were the thoughts he had to keep under control. You compare them to cows during the, the rainy season. That's the time when rice is growing in the rice fields. And if the cows wander into the rice fields to eat the rice plants, there's going to be trouble. So I had to beat them and check them and keep them out of the rice fields. Whereas if his thoughts were based on non-ill will, renunciation, harmlessness, then they were okay to think because you knew they were going to lead to good places or at least not lead to trouble. In that case, he said he could be like a cow herd during the dry season. The rice had been harvested. The cows couldn't get into trouble. And so they could wander where they liked. But be, and though the thoughts wouldn't lead him into trouble, thinking even skillful thoughts all the time gets the mind tired. And when the mind is tired, it can't control itself very well. So realized he would have to exert some more control. Even skillful thoughts, he said, he would have to keep in check as he got the mind to settle down in concentration. Because you bring the mind to concentration, you have to exert a lot of restraint. You're going to think only the thoughts that are connected with the breath. And any other thought, no matter how fascinating or interesting or right it may be, is wrong for right now. You want only the thoughts dealing with the breath. Finding out what kind of breathing is going to be comfortable right now. And when you get a sense of comfort, how you maintain it. And when you maintain it, how you make use out of it. Spread it around. Or how you spread it around. How you're aware of the whole body. Aware of the breath energy seeping through the whole body. And how you can maintain that perception. Those are things you have to think about until everything is very calm. Then you, can, then you can let your thoughts go. And at that point, you just have that one perception of breath, breath, breath. Because there is a sense of well-being. You're rewarded by having just that one perception. But until the rewards come, you have to exert some control, conscious control. This means that you have to look at your own thoughts, not as what you really think or who you really are or what your real feelings are about things, but simply fabrications that have habitually come to the mind. We're here to change our habits. This is one of the reasons why the Ajans talk so much about exerting control not only over your thoughts but also over your mouth. As John Fung said, if you can't control your mouth, there's no way you're going to be able to control your mind. And this is going to be an important part of the practice as you go through the day. And you treat your words the same way that Buddha treated his thoughts, not concerned with how much you really believe them or not, how much you like them or not, how interesting or fascinating or clever they are, but simply where they come from, where they're going to go. In other words, what state of mind lies behind those thoughts? Is it a skillful state of mind? And when you speak those thoughts, what are the results going to be? The Buddha said you should have a three-level set of filters. The first filter is, is it true? And if it passes that filter, then you put it through the second filter, was, is this beneficial? And does, will it really be helpful to yourself, helpful to other people if you say these things. But if it's true but not beneficial, you don't say it. But if it is true and beneficial, then it goes to the third filter, which is, is this the right time and place? 
And that requires a lot of sensitivity. You have to think about the people around you, what are they going to think, and what your words are going to do for them and what they're going to do to them, how receptive they are. And if they're not receptive, just tell yourself this is not the time for that. And a lot of other things come into, into play and just feeling, figure out the right time and the right place. We have to look for that. And this is how you show some wisdom. The world says you're clever when you have lots of ideas. But the Dharma says you're more clever when you learn some, to have some restraint over your ideas. Or if you have a good idea, have some restraint over when and where you say it. And John Sawai made a comment one time, he said, people really stupid are the ones who, are, who have an idea and they have to say it right away. Show some intelligence when you think about it. If I say this right now, what's the impact going to be? And be sensitive to the response of the people around you, so you get some feedback. They may say, well, I have to be sincere to myself or true to myself. But again, the Buddha says, your thoughts and your words are not you. In other words, they don't have to be you. You can choose to make them you, but is it worth it? And if you say, well, this is the way I am, this is my habit, well, then you make it impossible to practice, because the whole point of the practice is you're going to change your habits. The Buddha once said, if it's not possible for people to change their habits, in other words, to stop doing unskillful things and start doing skillful things, there would have been no point in his teaching at all. He just should have stayed under the Bodhi tree, continued experiencing the bliss of his awakening, the bliss of release. It's no wonder. He looked around the world right after his awakening and he said, this is, this is going to be really hard, teaching people. But then he thought, well, there were some people who would be willing to listen and willing to change their habits. So that's what gave him the energy to teach. And we look at all the monks and nuns who benefited, all the lay people who benefited. There were a lot that resisted, even the monks and the nuns. This is why we have all those rules in the Vinaya. You see all the times people report this monk did that, that nun did this. You can imagine the Buddha saying, why do we have to make a rule against this? People should know. So he had to make a rule. And then he tried to find a way around the rules, so he had to come up with new extensions to the rules. But he never got discouraged, because you know there would be some people who would take his teachings and benefit from them by changing their habits, changing what they do. After all, that's the basic teaching of the Four Noble Truths. What we're doing right now is leading to suffering. We can change our ways, act in different ways, and it can lead to the end of suffering. All the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are telling you, this is how you change your habits. So we're not here to be true to our feelings. We're here to be true to our desire for true happiness. That means turning around and looking at our feelings. Do they fit in with that desire? Any place where they don't, you've got to put them aside, put them aside. Any thoughts, any words that don't fit in, you put them aside. Because you see, it's not a question of defining who you are or getting in touch with who you are. It's more a question of where do you want to go? We follow the path for the sake of awakening. That's the purpose we should have in mind every time we open our mouths. Even every time we think a thought, is this leading to awakening or is this leading away? And if it leads away, why well, think it? So we have to learn how to step back from our thoughts, view them as part of a causal chain. It makes it a lot easier to step back from your thoughts if you don't keep saying them every time they pop into your head. You have to step back from your words as well. This way you're training the mind all the time. 
not just when you're sitting here with your eyes closed or doing walking meditation, but the whole day is an opportunity to practice. So remember, even though from the point of the view of the world, the clever people are the ones who have, ones who have lots of ideas and are not afraid to say them out loud. From the point of view of the Dharma, you want to filter things. You want to show some restraint. It's wise to show restraint because it will help take you where you really want to go.